I am very pleased to welcome you all to this Madrasa Midrasha event, which will be focused on art and creativity in chaplaincy. My name is Majabeen Dalla, and I am the Assistant Professor for Islamic Studies here at the GTU, and I also serve as Director for the Madrasa Midrasha program here. Um, we are also very grateful to the Center for Art and Religion as our co-sponsor for this program, and also for the Inter-Religious Chaplaincy Program, uh, who are also our co-sponsors for this event. Uh, very grateful to Lydia Webster, Dean Pena, and Dr. Kamala Bushamsia for their support. Uh, and of course, uh, a word of gratitude, utmost gratitude to the Walter and Elise Haas Fund that facilitates and supports our work here at the Madrasa Midrasha program. Without further ado, I'd like to invite uh, Sakina Al Habshi and Mia Trachenberg, who are our two Haas Summer Research Grant uh, recipients from last year, summer of 2021. And it is their coming together in a very creative and beautiful manner to produce this event for us. So uh, welcome Sakina and Mia and take it away uh, with this event. Thank you very much, Dr. Dalla. Appreciate your support um, and your introduction. Welcome everyone, peace and blessings unto you all. And I know you're here on your lunch break, munch away and just try and participate with us as, as you can and as you're able. I'm Sakina al -Habshi. I'm one of the international students here at the GTU. I came to the US about now three years ago and did my clinical pastoral education training residency and fellowship at Stanford Hospital. And I'm continuing my studies here at the GTU in a Masters in Islamic Studies, which I've just completed, alhamdulillah, and the Interreligious Chaplaincy Certificate. This event, as uh, Dr. Dalla just mentioned, that it stems from the work that Mia and myself um, had thanks to the Haas Student Research Grant in 2021. We explored how chaplains use art and creativity in their work. And here today, we've invited two of these chaplains to share their experience with the larger GTU community and beyond. Our research focused on two main areas, how chaplains use art and creativity to engage with their care seekers, as well as how they learn to cultivate their own self-care and resilience through art creativity. While some of our findings showed how chaplains directly connected to their Jewish and Islamic traditions and other traditions, we extended beyond those as well, through song, Hebrew song or melodious recitation of the Quran, appreciation of the creator and creation through nature-based reflections, poetry, um, other explorations of art and creativity extended into playing creative games, watercolor expressions, um, just that spiritual state of free flow and that prompted maybe writing and expressions in different ways. We realized that when artistic expressions were facilitated by chaplains in a non-judgmental, accepting and spiritually reflective approach, it seemed to allow for more freedom and more creative empowerment in the care seeker themselves. So I'll let our panelists um, share and we'll in I'll invite Mia to introduce herself. So. Um, thank you, Sakina. I wanna welcome everyone as well. Um, <clears throat> my name is Mia Trachtenberg. I am a master's student in the Center for Jewish Studies. Um, and also uh, as same as Sakina, um, student of the Interreligious Chaplaincy Certificate. Um, I got my Bachelor of Fine Arts at California College of the Arts in Creative Writing and Illustration. Um, and so, yeah, and I'd, I'd like to welcome our panelists. Um, our first panelist is uh, Takwa Surati, um, uh, Surapati, and, um, and a little bio about her. Um, so she's from Indonesia, and she's been a Bay Area resident since 1998. Um, and started visiting and provided spiritual care for patients since 2004. Um, currently, she serves as a cancer care chaplain at Stanford Healthcare, um, supporting oncology, hematology, and blood marrow transplanting patients and their families. Um, she has a master's degree in Islamic studies from the GTU, 
and a graduate certificate in Islamic chaplaincy from Hartford Seminary in Connecticut. Um, she is also on the board of the uh, Ziara Muslim Spiritual Care, and she got a first degree in architecture from uh, Institute Technology um, Bandung in Indonesia. Um, she worked as an architect there and an interior designer for hotel rooms and banquet halls um, for Singapore's prominent Orchard Road hotels. Um, and from these experiences, Takwa continues to create spaces of beauty, uh, physically and metaphorically. Um, her philosophy is to appreciate beauty and to gain strength from it. And she's very passionate about end of life care in palliative medicine. Um, she values compassionate care through human connection and believes that the work that she does is an expression of gratitude for Allah the Majestic One. Uh, she's blessed with family members who know and support her well, her husband, two sons, and daughter-in-law. Um, so that's Takwa. And then I want to introduce Amy. Um, Amy is a listener, a learner, and a lover of life's small joys. She is the co-founder and director of operations for the COVID Grief Network and has spent the past three years serving the Stanford Healthcare Hospital community, first as a spiritual care volunteer, and then as a chaplain resident, and now as a relief chaplain. Um, she holds a MS from Stanford University's Institute for Computational and Mathematical Engineering, and is currently pursuing an MDiv at the university, oh, sorry, in the Institute of Buddhist Studies. Um, Amy's spiritual homes include her Jewish and Buddhist communities, along with natural spaces, big and small, that ignite wonder and gratitude. She also loves mornings, books, and tea, especially all together. Yeah. Um, so, let's see. Um, so Sakina, do you want to start us off? We'll invite uh, Amy to begin uh, with the first prompt of the discussion. How do you use, Amy, art and creativity to engage with your care seekers or your patients in exploring and expressing their emotion and spirituality. As we progress, the chat box is open and the Q&A is open. Feel free to comment in the chat box and if you want to ask a question, just pop it in the Q&A box. That'll be easier for us to track as we go along and we'll come back at the end. Thank you. Thanks so much to everyone, Dr. Dalla, Sakina, Mia, um, and Takwa as well for, for being here. Um, so in thinking about that first question that Sakina just asked of um, how art and creativity have come up uh, in providing spiritual care to patients and helping them express emotions and, and relate to where they're at in their healing journey. Um, three components come up for me. The first is patient-led experiences. So those are patients that I'm engaged with who are artists who already have a creative spiritual practice and know what it looks like to support their healing through that. Um, and we're kind of helping to create a container for that to be able to happen in a hospital space where oftentimes um, the materials that they're used to having aren't, aren't there. Um, and uh, it might be kind of a, a leap to bring that into the hospital space. And the second area that comes to mind for me are, are chaplain guided um, experiences. So these are for people who might be like, oh, I'm not creative, right? You know, those types um, and, and need a little bit more guidance to tap into that part of themselves. And then the third component that comes to mind for me is sort of meta. It's, it's using art and creativity as an orientation to frame my work. And, and even the basics of chaplaincy, um, seeing them through a lens of creativity really helps me approach my work in a way that feels meaningful and important. Um, so I'll spend some time just going through each one of those briefly. Um, first, this patient-led approach, um, people who have creative practices. Um, the question is how we can help them leverage their art and their creative practices as a pathway to healing in a hospital setting, for example, which is where, where Takwa and I have worked at Stanford. Um, so I'll, I'll share two cases that have come up for me. Um, the first that comes to mind is a young woman in her mid-20s, um, and she was on the blood and marrow transplant unit, which was a unit Takwa and I actually shared uh, for, for one year together. Um, and she was, she was at the hospital for her second transplant. Um, so her, she had relapsed after her first one. And, um, you know, coming to the hospital for a second transplant, she kind of, you know, in some sense knew what she was getting into. It's a long, arduous journey. Um, and in the process, she, she wanted to find some way to give a sense of, of hope 
um, an encouragement, not only to herself, but people all around her, knowing that for a lot of people, this was a very scary first experience. And um, this young woman outside of the hospital, her career was as an artist. She worked for a, a well-known animation studio, um, drawing for, um, for animated films. And um, so she decided, I'll share um, an image of what she created. Um, there we go. So these are some examples of what she created. Um, she made these drawings along with some sort of inspiration that she wanted to share. And she made one for each and every door on her unit. Um, and while this was driven by her, it was her creation. And she kind of had this sense that she wanted to do something like this. It took a whole village. It took myself as a chaplain to encourage her and figure out what meaning it held in her own healing journey. It took the nurses to be able to encourage her and even the unit manager, right, to get these laminated. And she was discharged over a year ago. And I took these photos maybe uh, two weeks ago, right? So they're still over a year later um, on every door in the unit, continuing to, um, to spread her hope and encouragement. Um, so there... Um, yeah, just kind of a, a really sweet way of, of ex a creative expression of her hopes and wishes for herself and for others. Um, and that was her way of engaging with her emotions through art. Uh, a second example happened just a few weeks ago. Um, and this was with a woman in her mid fifties on um, the psychiatric unit at Stanford. Um, we had talked for a while and then towards the end, she asked if we could pray together. And um, she, she knelt at her bedside and, and kind of asked me, I, I knelt alongside her. She asked if I could pray for her and then if I might consider joining her in her form of prayer. Um, so, you know, incorporating her spirituality, which we had talked about and some of the things she had been hoping for and grappling with during her hospitalization, I, I offered a brief prayer. And then um, after I finished, she kind of looked at me and, and started her prayer, which was a sort of musical rendition of the Lord's Prayer. And she, she looked over a few times, kind of inviting me in, seeing if I would join. And I hadn't heard this version before, but picked up on the tune and, and knew the words. So I, I joined in with her. And as she did, she rose from a kneeling position, stood up, and, and then looked at me. And once she finished, she transitioned into a, a traditional spiritual. And she lifted her hands over her head, and I joined her in song. And she started marching and dancing, and we both were dancing and marching throughout her room. And um, it was just this, this brightness and energy that came about um, after what had been a really challenging conversation. And when we finished and exhaled, both of us there together, um, she was just beaming with a confidence that I really, I hadn't seen in her before when we were talking. Um, and in the psych unit specifically, the rooms are pretty spare. Often patients aren't allowed to bring in their personal items the way that patients in other units are. Um, but it, here she was able to bring in this part of herself. Um, and it was, again, fully patient-led, right? This was her song and her dance and her form of prayer. Um, she already knew what connected her to her spirituality. She just needed someone to support her in bringing that part of herself into the hospital and making space for it and saying, yes, that part, we can decorate the walls with our voice and our dance and our rhythms. Um, so that was a, a touching experience for me, again, that was patient-led. Um, and then the second arena that I was talking about, chaplain guided. Um, I'll just give two brief examples there. One was a, a middle-aged man, um, again, on the blood and bone marrow transplant unit who connected to spirituality deeply through nature. Um, and it was hard for him not being able to have access to that in the hospital room. And there were very specific spots in nature. He connected to the beauty of that place in a grounding, peaceful way. And so we worked a lot on visualization using the creativity within his mind to be able to transport him to these places that grounded him, that brought him peace, that brought him comfort and strength um, in times when he was feeling anxious or stressed. Um, and a second example of this sort of chaplain guided um, creativity during my residency at Stanford, I, I had the privilege of being able to work on a, a project in which I created um, some cards to engage people in creative ways of how they're relating to or experiencing their spirituality at the hospital. So um, they're kind of two decks. One um, are spiritual practices that people often have. So some of these you might, you know, consider when you think of a spiritual practice, prayer, meditation, but some of them are, are a little different, you know, listening to music, playing music, um, reflecting on mortality, being a parent, writing poetry. Um, so there are these practice cards and then another deck 
that are um, spiritual values. So generosity, beauty, joy, um, earth, surrender, mystery. Um, and then there are some blank ones and a pen that you can kind of write and erase. And um, so these were cards that I brought to people and I'll put a picture of them because I know you probably can't see my, um, my cards here as well. Um, so here's kind of an example of what these cards look like. Um, so engaging with patients, I would, um, I would bring these to them and, and sort of ask them the question usually of, of a specific scenario. So I actually use these with the artist before the cartoonist. Um, upon her discharge, thinking about what parts of her spirituality were going to be important for that next stage. Um, and people would usually go through the cards, separate the ones that resonate from the ones that don't, and then arrange them in various patterns of how they relate to each other and how they relate to the next step. And um, I found that there were a few things that felt beneficial about this strategy. One was creative agency, people being in charge of their own process of the product and the pattern. Um, they dictated the pace that we talked and, um, and sort of were able to create something in that space. Even if they didn't consider themselves artists, they were making art in my mind out of the materials of their spirituality. Um, and on the other side, it gave them some place to start. Sometimes as chaplains going in with these big questions of life, right? What is your spirituality? How is it coming up for you now? That can be really daunting for people who aren't used to having those conversations, um, but not having to generate answers from scratch, having something to point at and say, no, not that, and let me tell you why, or yes, this, and I want to talk to you about it, um, was a really helpful tool. Um, and, then, and then the last piece that I'll say about these cards is they, they offered multiple modes and levels of engagement on ramps to the spiritual, right? They're, they're physical, tactile. You can move them and touch them and, and visually, you can see the ways things are relating. Um, then there's also the verbal storytelling part. Each one is an opening. Um, and then there's the intellectual side, patterning, figuring out what's missing. Why, why does this core value I have not have a, a spiritual practice associated with it? What practice could help me bring that value more strongly into my life? Things like that. Um, so in working with a handful of patients with these cards, it's been meaningful to see the way kind of creativity has emerged in them. Um, and then that final third area that I was saying, so we have patient led. Um, oh, let me stop my screen share. So we have uh, the patient driven approach, the, the chaplain guided approach. And then the third one is I've, I've seen this as kind of a meta or orienting quality for me. Um, so I've found that within my own chaplaincy, um, I try to cultivate an environment of non-judgment, deep presence and, and freedom. And those are the three qualities when I was reflecting that really also are required for me to, to make art, spiritual art, right? If you have the inner critic above your head, um, it doesn't let what is inside of you come out of you in a free flowing way. Um, and so in art, you know, when you have a non-judgmental, fully present environment um, where you're free to create, free to let things come up, um, then oftentimes you, you're able to feel seen and witnessed. You're able to find different ways of engaging and relating to the present and what's going on in you. And uh, sometimes unexpected insights emerge, right? Connections or, or you produce something that, that taps into a healing that you didn't know you needed or that you didn't know you had the answers to in yourself. Um, and so my own engagement with spiritual art in that way kind of has that, that framing of the environment producing that outcome. And, um, and that's what I want to do in chaplaincy, right? I want to be helping to create that environment so that when a person, even if it's just talking, right, even if there's no art or, you know, design making happening, just the very act of being listened to in a certain way, in that deep, present, free, non-judgmental way allows things to emerge out of themselves, insights that relate to, um, that relate to their own healing um, deeply. So, um, yeah, thank you. I'm, I'll pass it back to the moderators to, to engage further. Thanks, everyone. Oh, I think you're muted, Mia. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Amy. Um, so, Takwa, do you want to talk about how you use your... Um, art and creativity with your patients? 
Hey, sure. Thank you for the invitation. And I also want to um, express my gratitude for the time and for the invitation. Um, I am so excited and also nervous at the same time. But you wouldn't know because I'm smiling. But this is good. So good morning, everyone. Um, Assalamualaikum. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In the name of God, the most merciful, the most compassionate. I do prepare some um, slides to, to be part of my presentation. So I'm going to try to... Let's see. Can you see it? Okay. All right. So um, I want to thank my colleague, Chaplain Xiaoxi, who is happened to be in the um, in the call. Um, yeah, and I also want to, I saw the chat, I want to um, express my deep appreciation for um, Chaplain Shosi for the template of the slides and also for Chaplain Amy for the very thorough and moving um, presentation about, um, about art and creativity. So, Next slide. Let's see. So um, I want to come first from this perspective, um, finding beauty in Islam, um, because I think that's where I tap into myself. Um, if I'm looking at art and creativity, um, it is actually um, part of finding beauty. And in Islam, which is a monotheistic faith in God, um, live through community with personal piety. Um, personal piety kind of like you depends on yourself, but then live through community. Sometimes it could be messy, but um, so the whole process I feel, you know, living Islam is, is that actually, um, to find beauty. Um, God is known from his attributes and in his divine names. Yeah, um, and then there is this saying in Islam that um, the messenger of God, peace and blessings be upon him, said that verily Allah is beautiful and he loves beauty. So Allah is a an Arabic word denotes God and um, has no gender, genderless, it's unique and one. Uh, Muslims believe that innate natural inclination towards beauty are embedded inside us, um, like an operating system, everybody has it. Um, and we believe um, this inclination, we call it fitrah. There is strength in beauty, that's not anybody saying, but my own, because when I start doing this work as a chaplain and experiencing um, deep conversations with patients, sometimes it could be really painful, but also, um, um, it invokes something inside me, which is, you know, at the end of it, I understand its strength in itself. Um, I try to cultivate beauty, just like Amy said, said in the interactions through conversations and then through actions, through space. Um, and then artistic expression, um, I think, can be everywhere through spoken words, poems, stories, or making art together. I really like how Amy um, frame it in the three um, patient led, chaplain led, and then kind of like the mix of meta between them. Um, to view art and creativity is a natural way of expressing beauty and values. So, of course, as a chaplain, number one is presence. You know, you're meeting patients or care seekers where they're at. You're not trying to fix or find a solution for the emotional or spiritual struggles and then finding, meet, finding meaning in the journey. Um, and then step two, um, I think when I visit patients, at first when they feel listened to or seen or heard um, without us, without judgment, without trying to fix stuff. Um, and then at the end, something evolved and come about. So my case over here is a blood marrow transplant patients. Um, she's 72 years old, a widow with no children. 
um, she talked, she was a homemaker for decades. And she said, I really enjoy doing that. I stayed home, take care of the house, take care of my family, take care of the yards. And she started telling me stories about these sunflowers and how she loves sunflowers. Um, she talked about lizards who ate the seeds of the sunflowers. Um, and then um, I decided to print out like a big 11 by 17 um, bright pictures of sunflowers just from Google image. I go there, find a beautiful picture of sunflowers. And then the next time I came over, I brought it to her and then she really loved it. And this is what we came up together because she, she was in the hospital for quite some time. So at that moment, you know, people go through journeys up and downs you know, as they are being hospitalized. Um, we came up with this meaning together. I said like, maybe you're a sunflower in your own way because you're turning towards the sun, just like the flowers. You're finding light and becoming light. You know, when people are heavy, their hearts are heavy. She said, I wanna live. You know, I know I'm old, but I still have um, things that I want to do. So this meaning of finding, you know, looking at the sunflowers, thinking of her own yard at home. And then I offered her this meaningful, you know, that you are always turning towards the light. You'll, you'll find that light, you know, metaphorically as a, as a sunshine light and also as a lightness in her heart. Um, that was very meaningful for both of us. Um, the other case that I have in mind was, um, this was a very hard case for, um, for the staff on the unit because this was a very young male, single, um, going through um, transplantation. He's only 26 years old. Um, he struggled with lots of medical issues. He stayed at the hospital for over, um, in total six months until he passed away. But, you know, he graduated college while he was in the hospital. Um, there's a lot of, um, you know, complications, um, issues, you know, medically, clinically, that um, it was one thing after another. And then all of the serious conversations, you know, were, you know, were being, discussed. But then again, like I mentioned, this journey of up and down being a hospital in the, uh, being a patient in the hospital, um, it could be very draining. And at some point, um, I just look at him and then he told me he liked to um, work on cars and he missed his own car, a sports car. And I said to him, like, can I offer you something? Shall we play? And then he looked at me and said, like, play what? And I said, I don't know, maybe play, I, maybe a car race. I said, you know, and then he laughed and he said, oh, Chaplain Takwa, sure, why don't we play car race? He was very, um, oh, he called me Miss Takwa. He didn't call me Chaplain Takwa. Every time he saw me, always like, Miss Takwa, how are you doing? He was always very polite, very kind, very soft in his presentation, mild mannered. Um, Everybody fell for him and everybody's rooting for him. And yet this disease is not something that um, sometimes it's like beyond, you know, medically and clinically of what we can do. Um, so I proposed the car race. Um, um, I purchased a bunch of wind up cars and then we set it up outside the corridor of his room. He passed away about two months after the race. I have some pictures that I could share with you. The one on the left corner here is before the race. Um, another um, staff member made the, um, the checkered flag. Um, I display all the, all the cars. Um, the unit manager, the nursing manager said, oh, I have some at home. So, and then I put up like a sign, racers, put your name down and put your cars it energized the whole unit, like the nursing staff. And people kept betting on this tiny car. Do you see this one? But guess what? This one doesn't go straight. It goes in a loop-de-loop. -loop. So everybody was betting on this one, kind of like, oh no. Um, 
the one on the bottom is when um when when we got the winner somebody made the podium and i'm gonna try to play this one It was not by the minute, but it really did make um, the patient and the staff, you know, joining together in that moment. Maybe I'll play this one. Too. You hear all the whooping and the, you know, that's what I call like uplifting the spirit and for, for everybody. Um, the last one. Oh, wait. Okay, this one. Um, also in the hospital, um, we, I am, we are, you know, chaplains at Stanford are really blessed with um, very beautiful surroundings. We have like a maintained garden and then they planted all these tulips. And then I just, you know, I said to the staff one time, you know, let's do tulip breathing. This is for staff. So I let them outside. I gathered their phone, I gave them instructions to um, not answering their phone or muted their phone and go step outside in the garden with the group of us. And then just notice, notice the nature, notice the beauty, notice how it makes you feel, what you hear, what you can smell, what you can see. Um, yeah, and it's coming like this again in springtime. Um, the last one that I have, so because it's easy for me to come up with signs or like little icons or drawings. So I, there is a, a young patient who was graduating um, high school while he was in the hospital. And, you know, he told me that he missed his friends. Um, so I said, why don't we celebrate you? So we celebrate, you know, this is what I call celebration of life through beauty. So we have, and I also happen to have his permission to, um, to share the video. Let's see. There's no sound, but we can see the image oh. i think because maybe you hadn't shared sound when you did the share screen oh i see sorry about that okay it's okay oh i see the cap and gown that was his father so father said on behalf of your parents and stanford happy graduation Oh, I'm so sorry you guys couldn't hear all the whooping. <sighs> and that concludes my presentation. Thank you so much, Takwa. Um, there's so much I want to highlight from both Amy and Takwa's first section. This is only the first half. We've picked up themes of tangible sensorial experiences with uh, the art and with play, with creativity non-judgment, presence, and freedom that comes uh, with working in this kind of um, modalities. Sometimes it's patient-led, sometimes it's chaplain-led, and sometimes it's something that is co-created together. And also I love the highlighting of the light, light coming in both ways, like light being illumination and also lightness and weight and heaviness that someone might be feeling in times of crisis. Um, we'll go ahead to the second half, and I want to invite Amy to now share on how she might, uh, how she experiences and uses art and spirituality of, for her own self-care and her own expression. Thanks so much, Sakina, and, and thank you, Takwa. I'm smiling so much seeing those videos and feeling that I feel like a sunflower that you've turned towards the sun just in your talk, so thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, in thinking about the way that I have used um, art and creativity in my own practices, um, I feel like they've really come alive um, since I've transitioned careers into chaplaincy, that it feels like this is the piece that I maybe didn't need before. I'm sure it would have benefited, but um, as a chaplain, finding ways to cope with uh, 
a lot of heavy, um, challenging interactions and conversations and experiences, um, meeting a lot of suffering. How do you hold all of that? And I've found that um, the art and creativity have been a tremendous tool for me. So I'll share just a few, a few ways that has been true for me. Um, the first experience that comes to mind actually goes back to these, these cards that I had talked about before. Um, as I was designing them, there was a patient that kept coming to mind, um, a uh, blood and bone marrow transplant patient, a, a young woman in her 30s um, with a young son and, and a husband. And she just, the types of conversations and interactions we had, the way that she engaged with and thought about her spirituality made her come to mind. And I just so deeply would have loved to to see what she created out of these cards and to use that as a launching point for, for further conversations with her. Um, unfortunately, she, she passed away before these kind of came into fruition and I started working with them. And um, so I, that was a, a loss that I took um, quite hard and, and took me a long time to process. And I realized that one thing that might help um, was to, to allow me to engage with her through these cards, even without her. Um, so I took some time after work and I went over to Stanford Hospital's chapel. Um, it's got this beautiful um, kind of blue wall with gold painting, a really peaceful space. Um, and I set aside a time of quiet reflection and I called this patient to mind, remembered um, her presence, her heart, her tenderness, her joy. She had an amazing sense of humor as well. And, and I started working with these cards and creating a pattern and listening to her and the ways that she was still speaking through me and letting that kind of impact um, the same creative process that I was doing with patients, allowing myself to be able to use it um, and, and relate to this, this lost patient through it as well. Um, yeah, so that's one example that comes to mind. And then on a broader sense, um, there are communities that, that do this work all the time throughout. And so one of them that I'll highlight that I'm involved with here in the Berkeley area is the Jewish Studio Project. Um, it's an amazing, you guys should check it out. It's really amazing. But they start from, from uh, sometimes Jewish texts or, or um, words that, that you'll kind of think about and analyze and, and from a Jewish perspective, think of different questions. And then you'll set all of that intellectual stuff aside um, and go make art. The studio that they have in, um, in West Berkeley has you know, big canvases and any material you can think of. Um, and you just create and see what comes up. The sort of tagline is, you know, if you're chewing on something, have you made art about it yet? Like, that's a way to process and work through. And then you come back afterwards and, um, and look at that piece of art and see in what ways it answers the initial question that you had and then put aside. Um, so that process of, of making art, um, both with the Jewish Studio Project and using their ideas of, of facilitation just in my own life and my own, um, and my own uh, creation has been really powerful and bringing insights that I, I wasn't expecting to arrive at. Um, and then the last one that I'll name that is probably the biggest in my own um, creativity and spirituality is singing. Um, I never thought of myself as a singer. Um, I, my parents always joke about being a little tone deaf and um, I have arrived recently though at, at being able to find song as a true outlet. Um, so during my residency, I commuted by bike um, through the Stanford Arboretum. I'll show you guys a picture for those of you who aren't familiar, um, but I'd mostly be commuting at sunrise or sunset. And so through the Arboretum, can maybe see um, the sun would pour in through the trees, um, just this beautiful setting. And Takwa mentioned there is strength in beauty. And I think that beauty just kind of would, I would drink it in and feel the strength of the nature around me. Um, and, and in it, I would, I would sing. I would either chant um, Jewish prayers of healing, um, sometimes chanting Buddhist refuge or dedication chants, sometimes um, singing other kind of just prayerful secular songs that grounded me in, in the power of nature and connection to the earth. Um, I would improvise poems. I would kind of start with, you know, uh, Mary Oliver has a poem, Hello, Sun in My Face. So I would start with Hello, Sun in My Face and then just kind of let the words flow of what was I, what was I working through? Um, what did I need the earth to hold with me? What wasn't like I able to hold just on my own but needed to be held in a collective and song for me? Um, the fact that it's like this physical embodied vibration within me that then transfers into the vibrations of the earth. Um, there's something so powerful in that. Um, so 
yeah, so song has, has been a huge part. And if we have time at the end after Q&A and if people are interested, I can, uh, I've got a guitar here and a voice right here so we can play around and see what comes up if people are interested at the end. But um, yeah, so that's been a powerful thing. I love song and community most of all, but even especially in these pandemic times, being able to sing um, while speeding along on a bike <laughs> through an arboretum has been a big spiritual practice of mine. Um, yeah, and I'll pass it back to the moderators. Thank you guys so much for setting this up. Thank you, Amy. Um, <clears throat> well, I love how, how you use so many different kinds of creativity to heal yourself after taking in all so much pain from others. Um, I love how you combine nature and song and like one kind of dance that you're doing every morning and every evening it kind of it's like it's like a sun salutation kind of but like combining so many different religious practices and art practices and spiritual practices um and it really like embodies that sort of interreligious spirit that a lot of chaplains have so i think that's really cool um okay i'm gonna invite takwa to speak on this now actually so um yeah how do you use creativity and spirituality and art to heal yourself after yeah um so i was thinking about this question this morning and i said to myself what kind of art do i do like in the form of like media and then um i remember i'm i'm taking classes you know after work nighttime or like in the weekend and i'm someone who can learn um, like I'm more like audio learner so if I hear the lecture I'm kind of like understand it better but I also um, I go through school taking notes like very detailed notes so I think right now in my adult year I kind of like combine both of them together so if I'm listening to a, like a this is like really just classes that I'm taking. So we're talking about Islam and understanding of Islam and of life, palliative, all of that good stuff. So I'm listening to it, but I also taking notes. And then what I find myself actually concentrating better when I'm sketching. So like even through meetings, sometimes I sketch stuff, you know, listening still, but you know, while we're doing online meetings. so. I sketch or if I have a paint, I kind of like make some doodles. So I think that's one part of my brain that's, you know, while thinking the other part is also kind of like doing its own job. And then at the end of a meeting, I take a look at that in the back of a, like, you know, when you buy cookies at Starbucks, they give you this brown bag. I look at it and like, hey, what did I make? You know, it's almost like, something impulsive that I don't really plan. But sometimes I sketch knowing what I want to draw, right? So that's one thing. Um, I also um, um, recite the Quran out loud and I think it really helps for me to hear it. Um, so every morning I join this um, ladies group of reciting the Quran, we take turns and then um, I just hear a podcast about nine Enneagram. You know, for who of you not familiar with Enneagram, um, it's a type of personality, um, a personality typing based on, um, based on like an ancient history knowledge. So um, they would divide, you know, um, your center of wisdom. It's either came from, your um, head, brain thinking, your heart, um, sadness, um, you know, main emotions or gut feeling. So I'm from, I'm based it on my body gut feeling. I'm a nine type. Um, they said that it's really helpful if you can uh, like project your voice out, you know. So I, I like doing that. I like reciting the Quran out loud. And I also like to sing. And guess what? Now, I have a commute from Stanford to San Jose. You know, I can just sing. And the funny thing is that sometimes these days, if it's appropriate for those sappy um, love songs, <laughs> instead of picturing, you know, my husband or, you know, persons, 
I actually picture Allah like there was this one song I'm kind of like you make me happy you fill my heart all of that <laughs> and I'm kind of like singing along with the melody I'm kind of like oh yeah yeah that's you ya Allah I have this spiritual commute I think that's what I'm trying to say I'm also um so I sketch I do drawings um I appreciate nature and beauty um, and also I get really distracted. Do you remember those movies about, I think it's a Disney movie. There's a dog talking, but then he was like, oh, squirrel, go see squirrel. So very distracted. I can be that way sometimes. So, so I, I distract myself with beauties of you know, in, in nature, there's so much beauty in nature and in each other within people. So I look for those. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jacqueline Takwa. Um, I loved your little anecdotes of singing in the car. And I noticed there's a similar theme with Amy and her singing and poetry and her commute and your commute. and how that can often be a really good time for processing and for raising creative energy also. Um, I'm aware of the time also, so I'm gonna start jumping into, we had a couple of questions already, rather than me highlighting and reflecting on your and many, many gems. Let's address some of the comments and questions from the audience. There's a brief one um, right at the beginning, Eliza wanted to check in with Amy did that patient get to see her artwork on the doors of the other rooms? Did she get to see that? She did, yeah. I think she, um, that, that was part of it, is she had, um, you know, always wanted to do this, but especially on the BMT unit, um, immunocompromisation is such a, um, a touchy point. And so finding a way to get them laminated so they could actually stay up. So she, before she left, she, she knew she had that legacy, which, um, yeah, which is a really special part of the process. Yeah, I love that, thank you. Um, Mia, do you wanna pick up? There's a couple of questions in the Q&A box here also. Yeah, I can go with the first question. Um, what are the three factors in meta-orientation? This person got non-judging and reflecting. If Takwa or Amy, you have any answers to that? I think I might've been the one to use the, the phrase meta-orientation. Um, I don't know if there, you know, there's necessarily a set three factors. I think what I was naming um, some of the things that come to mind for me as like creating that environment are, are non-judgment, deep presence and freedom um, are like three things for me that create an environment that let me produce art in a spiritual way. And those are also sort of in parallel, the three things that felt um, like core aspects of allowing a creativity and conversation and engaging with a patient and their emotions. So I don't know if that answers um, let me know if not. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think freedom was one of the ones that, mm -hmm. that's a good one. Um, and then another question from Kamal, um, how do you overcome barriers related to connecting and capturing the artistic culture of diverse communities, such as language, meaning, images, et cetera? I think that's a good one for both of you to maybe reflect on, if you could. Mm -hmm. Um, I saw this question earlier and my mind already started um, <laughs> thinking about it. So I think um, because we're we're an inter we're a trauma one hospital. So I do have, you know, Stanford does receive patients not only from local communities but also from um, international communities. So um, I think I remember I brought clay because the patient said. This is pre-COVID maybe, I think so. I brought, or maybe not, I don't know. I think I asked permission. I asked the, um, the, the, the nursing staff, I asked the doctor, yeah, you're right. I asked the medical team um, to see if I could brought clay and, um, and provide it as like a, an activity for both patient and me. And then I think we just made, um, we made little breads, we made, you know, little cats. So even though um, 
this is this patient came from a different cultural background but i think through making art together you know with everyday objects that you know we can identify with with our life I, it's um, like art is a common language um, through that um, i want to also offer a story about lullaby um, so this lullaby theme has been going on for some time in this past six months maybe there's a couple of patients that I um, that that their their value is strongly through their um, either being a father or being a mother and being sick with life threatening illness at the hospital. It's it's something that really they grieve that they life might not be um, long to see their children grow up and both childrens are like babies. So. I ask them, you know, when if you're at home, what do you do when the babies, um, you know, what kind of lullaby do you sing? Um, and the male patient was a father, and he said, "Well, you know, he doesn't connect with anything." And then, and for some reason, I I offered him my lullaby in Indonesian. And that was a very moving experience because it was really private to me and my both my children that they're, they're grown now. And that's the first time ever I offered that. Um, but then it became like some sort of a, um, like a theme because the lullaby itself is, um, I sing it in Indonesian. I tried to translate it. I said, this means a mother's love. And then they, the wife of the patient, the mother of the patient, the aunt, everybody surrounding this uh, young patient, young father, they're really like connect with that. And it becomes like a, a, a theme, like a major, because the patient himself, he, um, he doesn't really identify with any religious um, preference to the point that when he's in the ICU, I came and then the mother said, oh, Tahua is here you know, could you sing him this lullaby? So he went through a procedure that was very scary for him. I forgot what was that. He could not breathe and they were trying to assess him whether to be intubated or not. And I sang that as a way for him to focus on my voice um, instead of the chaotic environment. So that in itself became like a theme throughout his hospitalization, um, the mother's love. It's almost like a prayer chanting in itself. The other patient who was a mother, international patient, um, couldn't see her son, you know, because she was sick and pursuing treatment here at Stanford. And then I asked her, actually, could you please sing me the lullaby, um, like the same question? And then she, she initially said no, and I said, yeah, I want to hear. And she, it was very moving, but also very healing, I think, for her. And then, And I empowered her. I said, you know, because she was sad that she could not um, see her son and her son might not remember her. And I said, like, no, you sing, you record it, you give this to your husband, tell him, like, play this every time, like, bedtime. So, yeah, I hope it's not too long of an answer. Amy, go ahead. <laughs> Talk about Amy. Yeah, no, that's beautiful, Takwa. I'm smiling. At, oh, I love that. And I think the uh, briefly, the two things that come to mind are also song across language. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of one patient who was um, saying to me in Spanish some songs that were helping her create, uh, her connect to this sort of um, the Holy Spirit that she was feeling in, in her. Um, and um, I think that Takwa points out, we're interfaith chaplains. We're, we're trained in deriving that sort of meaning and, and um, connection across faith traditions and cultures and backgrounds. And one thing that's coming to mind actually was for a Ramadan event that we did, um, Takwa taught myself and several others um, a, a, a brief prayer um, in, in Arabic. And it, it, I, I don't know the name of it, but it starts with Allah Akbar. Allah Akbar. So I, I actually, that became my, my spiritual commute song for, for many weeks and um, able to sort of connect to, to the way that I connect to Allah. And um, yeah, so I, I think, thank you for that question, Kamal. There's, there's, it almost 
is more generative and beautiful to bring in the diversity of perspectives and things emerge that you might not expect when you hear things in a different language that taps into a different part of spirituality or um, get to see um, a different culture's connection to things. So thank you. Thank you both. Um, and I want to add also on that, I think as chaplains, we're often doing this iteration and reiteration of we offer something and we are we have possibly alternatives and then the patient or the care seeker may offer something back and then there's consent in trying something out does it does this feel helpful not helpful do you try something else so there's some assessment going on and then some uh consent gauging there's some experimenting there's some reassessment and offering alternatives so that helps kind of narrow down across artistic or whether uh, differences in language or meaning or images that come all brought up, what might be helpful and work for this particular person. It's like a continuous trial and error process, I feel. Um, and it, it might change from day to day. Something might work today and the same patient might not work tomorrow. Um, that's sort of one of the interesting parts of uh, our work. There was a question in the chat briefly, which the writer retracted, but I think it's an important comment also. Sometimes we it struggle, sometimes we struggle to find beauty in like a location that physically may not look beautiful. So you may not have a tulip garden or like a pretty chapel to go to or something. Um, and, and where do you, how do you still find that beauty in places where it's elusive? Let's just wrap up with that one briefly and then we'll have Amy sing and I think Majabi will do a closing and let's see me Hi, okay. <laughs> um, um, you, I think you don't, yeah, I agree. It is um, different institutions can give out different vibes, but I think something um, originates from yourself and bring meaning um, you know, um, some time ago in the unit, the you can do like art, you can make art. And then if it's allowable, uh, if the institution allowed it, that it could be a communal art. You can color a mandala and stitch it together and becomes one big art. You know, um, different colors, different people expressions. You can do like a, so you're making art. You're, you can do like a hand print and then um, make it into like, frame it, make it into a beautiful um, piece of art that I think that, you know, just appreciation of, um, you know, either the media art or kind of like finding beauty within ourselves and within our cohort. I always think like um, something sweet, you know, literal or like metaphorical, um, metaphorical um, understanding that could count as art and creativity and bringing people together. Yeah, put out like a, um, a Hershey's kiss maybe every Friday. Oh yeah, I did this. Like every, after Friday prayers, I put out like frappe matcha and coffee. So that is something sweet in itself that people are like, oh, this is free. Like, yeah, help yourself. Maybe that. I'll just add that. Yeah. This is, I think this is Takwa's superpower, um, is taking a place that maybe you can't imagine how it can be considered beautiful and whether it's a Hershey's kiss or, you know, a single flameless candle or something, there's a way to, to f have something that, that fixes your attention. I feel like so much about um, creativity and, and spirituality is where is your attention at? And if, if you can find something that orients you, you know, turns your face towards the light, like the sunflower, um, then, then you can start seeing beauty um, throughout, no matter how, how institutional or concrete um, the room is. I want to disclaim the magic. <laughs> <laughs> My one. <laughs> it's been so, such a, um, a pleasure moments with you guys throughout. Thank you. Amy, do you want to give us your song? Sure. I'll, uh, I'll close this out with, um, maybe I was thinking of which one. I, I was going to share one that I kind of, um, you know, one that I often use to, to unload, but I think 
I'm, I'm smiling right now, I'm feeling light. Um, so instead of that, I'll maybe instead share uh, uh, just a little song of, uh, it's loosely based off of um, the concept of metta within the Buddhist tradition um, and sort of wishing um, loving kindness to, to those around us. So um, the words are simple, you'll get used to it. It goes in order and I'll just sing. And when you feel ready to leave, oh no, does Dr. Dalla, do you wanna say some words first? That way, um, if people want to leave, I wanna make sure you get whatever you need to say in. Uh, this has been so fascinating uh, throughout this presentation. Every time I had a thought and my heart felt something and I, before I went to the keyboard, somebody had already put it in the chat. So I want to thank everyone who's been sharing such lovely comments, these words of hope and appreciation and gratitude. And what's left for me to do is really to share that gratitude and resonate with that sense of gratitude. And thank you, Amy and Takwa, for your presentations, the words that are that are jumping in my heart are, are beauty and love and kindness and finding strength and encouraging hope in, in such challenging times. And I don't know if I can do credit to thank you for this energy that you brought with you to our little uh, presentation and this energy that you share with someone, so many people who need it. So I, all I can say is, may you receive more than what you have shared and that you continue to share. I also want to thank Sakina and Mia for organizing this. You know, thank you for, for your work that you did as a, a summer research grantees. And we appreciate this. Thank you so much. Thank you to Matt for, for making all this possible. Thank you for CARE, you know, for co-sponsoring and for the Interreligious Chaplaincy Program as well. And thank you to the uh, Walter and Elise Haas Fund that brings and facilitates all this beautiful energy. Um, so I, I'm, I'm just going to stop there and thank you for uh, taking us away with this song. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your presence, all those who attended, and for your encouraging comments. Thank you. There will be a recording of this on the YouTube um, soonish. So if you want to rewatch or share it with others. Um... Thank you so much, everyone. And I'm uh, noticing in the chat, I love this Marie Yang, the joyful noise section of the choir. So for this, you're on mute. So you can uh, you can sing loudly and be a joyful noise wherever you are. Um, so I'll put the, the words in the chat. They're simple. They go through um, and uh, sing with me as you get the rhythm, if you will, or just listen. May we all be happy. Gratitude and metta to Dr. Dalla and Sakina and Mia for setting this up and for Matt. May they be happy. be happy.
hope you have a beautiful day that is filled with inspiration and creativity in whatever ways it, it touches your hearts. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Amy. That was so beautiful. Uplifting. Hmm. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you next month with another Madrasa Madrasha event. Thank you. Bye. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum.